chapter 12, we will be looking at the great spiritual adversary to Christ's rule this morning. This is one of these texts, uh, Michael back here in the back, man, I was thinking of you this week as I was studying for this text because this is right up his alley. Uh, but this is, a, this is an interesting one, and I think uh, it'll be a challenge for us this morning as we look at it. As we jump into this, let me, um, let me just ask this question. What terrified you as a child? The dark. The dark. <laughs> just the dark. Lots of things, right? It could be the dark because that's where these scary creatures lived, right? I mean, our imaginations would run wild as child children about what scared us. The greatest, I'm going to, I've discovered this about myself. I I come across extroverted at times, but I'm really an introvert about most of the details of my life that I keep pretty well hidden from almost everyone. Uh, And I I, I look pretty emotionally detached most of the time. But there was a nightmare that I used to have as a child that terrified me. And if I still have it today, it still terrifies me. And I, I never remember my dreams. I'm one of these people who If you ask me right after I wake up, what did you dream about? I got no idea, right? I never remember them. But this one I remember, and I'll still have it reoccur once in a while, right? It still scares me. But I used to have this dream where, and my parents will are here today, and they will think this is hilarious when I tell them who this is, but there was this person from my childhood who I would only ever see very rarely, okay, but he would pop up in my dream, and then at some point in the dream would transform into the big bad wolf, all right? And and that terrified me as a child when I'd wake up from that dream, and I still, once in a while, will have that crazy dream, and it is. It's this terrifying thing. Right? There's, there's stuff when you're a kid that's scary. Revelation 12 is meant to be scary, frightening. I mean, that's what John is trying to do with the imagery in this particular text. It's a horrifying theme. And it's, it's really hard for us to try to picture this today because uh, we, we dismiss the supernatural so much. But John is creating for us a terrifying picture of the supernatural world. I honestly think one of the best analogies to this is something that as, as history will look back on our day and age right now, the time we're living in, as one of the great pop culture icons of this generation. I think this probably captures almost what John's got going on here the best, and that is Stranger Things. All right. Now, I know fourth season Stranger Things started Friday night. If you are one of those weirdos who's binge-watched the whole thing, please do not come up and tell me what's going on, all right? I've only seen two episodes so far, uh, and I don't want to know what happens, okay? So don't start informing me on that, but my family likes Stranger Things, okay? And uh, we watch Stranger Things, and I, I think it's part of this this younger generation is fascinated with the 1980s. I don't know what it is, but we're watching Stranger Things, and I'm pointing to my, those are the shoes you have, Emily. Look at that. Those kids are wearing your shoes. Look, the shorts you're wearing are the shorts that we wore in the 1980s, right? And she, she dismisses that, but it's true. They, they, they love it. I mean, they think the 1980s are so cool, and that show's set in the 1980s, right? But it, it delves into the supernatural, this, this spiritual world that's going on around us. And it's, it's got, if you've watched the show, scarifying, terrifying creatures in this thing that are at play in our world. And so much is passed off as science fiction, but... In reality, that's the picture John's painting here, that there is a spiritual world that is terrifying that is around us. Just as a sidebar, if your kids are like super enamored or your grandkids are super enamored with stranger things, a friend of ours wrote a book called The World Turned Upside Down, The Gospel According to Stranger Things. I would recommend this book to you, okay? It's very good. It takes a lot of the details from Stranger Things, and then not that it's the gospel in Stranger Things. The Duffer brothers are not Christians, okay? But the storytelling in Stranger Things of good versus evil, of this great cosmic story that's going on, is the story of Scripture. You'll see this all the time in pop culture. Why? Because good storytelling mirrors the Bible, and the Bible is the best story ever, okay? And so there's a lot of parallels that you can find. And if they're enamored with that, I would say get them this, because it will challenge them with the gospel in a way that they probably haven't seen it before. So it's a, it's a pretty good little read if they're stranger things, friends, okay? Uh, that's my little blurb about that. We'll get back to the message now. 
But the idea of this great cosmic struggle, supernatural beings, scary, terrifying stuff, that's what Revelation 12 is all about. How did we get to this particular chapter? Well, last week we saw chapter 11. And as you remember from last week, chapter 11, I I think, presents to us the content of the scroll that John ate at the end of chapter 10. He's in this vision sequence, this interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. And God is giving his rationale, his perspective about, yes, judgment will come and people will not repent. That will not result in them coming to faith. But the witness of my people, my revelation of my word lived out through my witnesses will bring people to glorify me. And that happens towards the end of chapter 11. But as John consumes this plan of God for his people that God is going to usher in through Christ's coming kingdom, chapter 11 then presents In microcosm, in in kind of this shortened one-chapter view, the unfolding of all of these big themes that will be played out in the rest of Revelation. It began with the measuring off of the temple, God's people. I'm going to have my people, and I will protect them. They are measured off, and yet at the same time, persecution will be all around them. And they will witness And you get the picture of these witnesses that come and and, and much of their activity, they are empowered with these supernatural abilities. And yet God will, at the end of the ministry there, allow what? It looked like them to be defeated. They, they, They are put to death by the beast. And it seems like the opposition to God wins by these witnesses being stamped out. And yet God will, after three and a half days, raise them from the dead in this particular vision, right? They're raised to life, resurrection life. This, in a sense, mirrors the ministry of Jesus Christ, the miraculous, the powerful, and yet it seems like evil prevailed. It stamped him out, and yet three days later, Christ was risen from the dead. And it's through God's performance of resurrection, of life out of death, that ultimately people come to the place where they finally bring glory to God. Some are saved in that particular vision. And then, as Revelation 11 concludes, you have these great themes of of the seventh trumpet blowing and the announcement that God's, or the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, this transformation that will happen at that great day of the Lord in which this kingdom will come. And they sing and heaven sings about the victory that is won and how ultimately God's rule will be established in which the dead are judged, the righteous are rewarded, and then the destroyers of this earth themselves are destroyed. The microcosm there of the rest of Revelation as the destroyers are introduced and then ultimately defeated by God before he establishes his presence on this earth in his millennium and then in his new creation. And and essentially, that's where chapter 11 ends, right? The temple of God in heaven is opened and there is the ark in unmitigated, unveiled presence. The ark, the place where atonement takes place. Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of everything that that represented has made a way open so that God will dwell with his people in eternity. His temple, his dwelling completely opened to any and all who receive the gift of his atoning sacrifice through his son. All of these themes that come up there. God establishing his rule, his presence dwelling in glory with his people. And now chapter 12 of Revelation begins to unpack this microcosm and it starts addressing these destroyers of the earth. We'll see the first one of them introduced here in chapter 12 as the great adversary, the spiritual adversary to God, Satan himself. And then in chapter 13, we'll see the great beast that is the Antichrist. And eventually we'll see the great beast that, or the, the false prophet come and you get the three destroyers of the earth. And then ultimately Babylon itself. And then God will undo that system of Babylon. He will end the Antichrist and his false prophet. And ultimately he will defeat Satan, casting him into the lake of fire in chapter 20. Establishing his rule and reign in his new creation as he dwells with his people. All of that's coming. So where's Revelation 12? It's this depiction of Satan. It's what Satan is about as the great spiritual adversary to God's rule, Christ's rule. And it's done in three scenes. So let's look at these scenes and what they teach us then about this rule of Christ, this defeat of his great adversary. The first sign 
Or the first, the first scene is actually two signs, two heavenly signs, a pregnant woman and a terrifying dragon. Notice verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns on its heads. And its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment she gave birth or he was born. There's this depiction, these two signs, a scene in heaven, in the sky. This, this vision seems to be working on a couple of different levels. And let me just explain them a little bit here. Some have seen in this woman, who is this woman? Is it a particular person in history? Some have seen this as Mary, that the the woman here is Mary because she is the one who gave birth to whom? Jesus, the Messiah. That's the one who would come from her. And Obviously, this is Messiah who is born here in verse 5. He's the one who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. But this description goes beyond Mary. I I don't think that's what it is. It's broader than that. Others have seen the imagery here depicting, because the woman remains unnamed and what comes out of her, as depicting Israel, as depicting the people of God at that time. And the vision sort of does lean in that direction. Why? Because of some of the descriptors here. She's, she's, uh, the, the sun and the moon are there. The 12 stars are there. And you, you get these signs in heaven. And, and if you go back in the Old Testament, there's an interesting scene in the life of Joseph, right, where Joseph has this dream about his parents, Jacob, and his, his mother, Rachel, bowing down to him as the sun and the moon, and his, his brothers, the 12 sons of Jacob, essentially bowing down to Joseph. And, and so some have seen this then, a depiction of Israel, and I, I think there's truth to that. There's another, a little bit more bizarre, but it probably is at play in this, is that this is a a sign, he says, in the heavens. It's a sign in the sky. That's how this could be translated as well. And that some have seen here a reference to some of the constellations, specifically ones that were there in the ancient Greco-Roman and ancient Jewish understanding of the zodiac, all right? And the the constellations of a virgin that was in the ancient um, zodiac signs that there was a virgin in the constellations, like Virgo, okay? And that when the, the, the sun and the moon are in the same spot in the sky, or the sun especially during the day where it's sitting in, where in that specific spot in the sky, that that would announce a specific day within history, within the calendrical year, speaking probably of the dating of the birth of the Messiah, I would say there, that, that there's probably a lot of truth to that particular view as well, but I don't have the time to go into all of the detail around that. I think the vision is playing on a number of levels. It's, it's pointing to the birth of Christ. It's pointing to the, the first coming of Messiah. At the same time, it is a depiction of the people of God giving birth to him at that time, which would have been Israel, and ultimately his great defeat of this dragon, and that's one of the interesting things about the signs in the heavens. There actually is a time when the Virgo sign is by the dragon sign, or hydra, in the uh, ancient zodiac, and that that probably plays into this somewhat, okay? We're not going to go down that road right now. Ultimately, in the larger context, the woman represents the people of God at the time of Christ's coming, Israel in anticipation of their Messiah. So what do these things teach us? What do these signs teach us? Four truths I want to see here out of these first six verses. Number one is this. God perfectly planned to deliver his people from the distress they were in through his Messiah. The woman is pictured as beautifully adorned, beautifully dressed. This is a glorious picture. And yet at the same time, she's described as being in distress and pain of childbirth. Childbirth is that, right? It's, it's this beautiful event, and yet it's also this very painful event. Now, much of modern medicine has relieved some of that. We can, we can take certain blockers and stuff, and the woman can experience childbirth with little pain comparatively, right? Like that can go on in modern medicine. That was not how it worked in the ancient world. Childbirth was also a very dangerous thing because it was a danger to the woman who was giving birth. Many times there would be fatality on her part in the the birthing process. It was a a, a dangerous picture to the ancient world. But it's this beauty and this 
pain and this distress at the same time in childbirth. It's picturing the people of God at the coming of their Messiah. What what was going on in Israel in anticipation of Messiah? Israel, this, this nation that God had chosen to reveal himself through, to use as his instrument to bring about his great plans of salvation, not only for them, but for the world, found themselves no longer an independent nation. They had lost that. Their king was no longer ruling on the throne. They were a state within the larger Roman Empire. They were under Roman oppression and Roman rule. And no matter how much they bucked against that, they could not overthrow it. And so this nation was in turmoil, in distress, longing for the day that God would step in again, bring his Messiah, end this oppression, and establish his rule. They longed for that day. That's the context in which God chose to send his son into the context of the suffering of his people. He still works that way today. That in the midst of our turmoil, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our difficulty, God, we long for that day when God intervenes once again and delivers. God perfectly planned to deliver his people through this distress by his Messiah. But at the same time, here's another truth, Satan destructively attempted to thwart God's plan by devouring his son. That's verses 3 and 4. This imagery of the dragon evokes terror, it evokes fear, it it evokes repulsion. I mean, think about this, This, the vision of this. A woman about to give birth, and there's this monstrous dragon sitting right there waiting to devour the child. It's a very gory and disturbing picture. This image, though, builds on numerous texts both from the ancient world as well as from the Old Testament scriptures about women, about peril, about serpents and dragon imagery. And I'm not going to get into the extra-biblical stuff because some of that is, is crazy, but it parallels some of the stuff that would have been going on in the minds of these people. But just from the biblical perspective, think about this. This is one of the earliest stories in our Bible. This is Eve in the garden with the great serpent, Satan himself, and the serpent coming to thwart God's plan by deceiving and going after Eve, and ultimately the promise that a seed, a child, would come from Eve that will crush the serpent's head. All the way back in Genesis 3, we see this story begin. It's fascinating how Israel is depicted as escaping from Pharaoh, escaping from Egypt, where Egypt and Pharaoh are depicted as this great sea monster or dragon in Ezekiel 32 too. We will look at that passage in a moment. And yet throughout the Old Testament, here's the point, Israel's God, Yahweh, is the one who defeats this great adversary and delivers his people. Let's look at a couple of these. Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 74. Psalm 74. This is a psalm that's written in a time of Israel's distress. Israel feeling like God has abandoned them. They're under turmoil. They're in despair. And where is God in this? And yet they look for a day, verse 12. God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. What a, what a fascinating word that Hebrew word for salvation is. It's the word Yeshua. It's the Jesus is actually named after this Jewish word, right? Uh, A fascinating concept, especially in this context. But verse 13, it was you who split open the sea, speaking of God, by your power. You broke the heads of the monsters in the seas. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave it as food to the creatures of the desert. It was you who opened up springs and streams. You dried up the ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours, and yours also is the night. You established the sun and the moon, and it was you who set all the boundaries of the earth, and you made both summer and winter, and we could go on and read this text. It sounds like a creation text, and yet it also sounds bizarre in God crushing sea monsters. So what's going on there? It's playing off of very ancient Canaanite myths about creation. This is how ancient peoples thought creation came about. The gods destroyed the wicked forces and then established human creation. Israel isn't saying they buy into that, but what Israel is saying is those stories you guys tell yourselves, our God is the one who ultimately created, and our God is the one who defeats the great monster, the great Leviathan. 
That's spoken of here in Revelation chapter, or not Revelation, in Psalm 74. Let's go to another one. Take your Bibles and flip over to Ezekiel 32. I mentioned this one a moment ago, but Pharaoh is likened to this, and so is Egypt as this great monster. Ezekiel 32, in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month of the first day, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take up a lament concerning Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, you are like a lion among the nations. You are like a, it's the same word as in Psalm 74, a monster in the seas, thrashing about in your streams, churning the water with your feet, muddying the streams. This is what the sovereign Lord says, with a great throng of people, I will cast my net over you. Yahweh says he's gonna throw a net over this great sea monster, and then I will haul you up in my net onto the dry land, and I will throw you on the land, hurl you on the open field, and I will let all the birds of the sky settle on you, and all the wild animals gorge themselves on you. It speaks of this monster being ripped apart by the creatures of this earth at its destruction. This is a very bizarre passage because we will come back to it when we get to Revelation 19 and 20 because the same imagery that's used at the great day of the Lord and the final defeat of Satan at that battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is this same story. This is the only passage in all of judgment texts in Scripture where birds come down and devour the enemies of God. It's in Ezekiel 38, 39, here, and then in Revelation 19 and 20. Speaking of that great day of the Lord, it's the great supper of the Lamb. I thought we're all going to be sitting there eating these great foods in heaven. The great marriage supper of the Lamb is Leviathan getting chewed up by all the wild creatures of the earth. All right, That's what's being served at that great supper. It's the destruction of evil. Quite a picture, right? It's pretty harrowing stuff. That's, that's this, all right? That's the Old Testament background of these things. One more text, Isaiah 27. Look at Isaiah 27, verse 1. Actually, you've got to go back to Isaiah 26. In the, what's considered the little apocalypse of the, gospel, or the book of Isaiah, these judgments that God calls upon the nations and his deliverance of his people, he anticipated a day, or Isaiah anticipated a day For the land of Judah, although they were oppressed, it would be a great day of salvation and deliverance for his people. Where it seems like they are dead, they will be brought back to life. Notice verse 16 of Isaiah 26. Lord, they came to you in their distress when you disciplined them. Speaking of his people, you could barely whisper a prayer. As a pregnant woman about to give birth writhes and cries out in her pain. Boy, that sounds a lot like Revelation 12, right? We were with child, the people of God were with child. We writhed in labor, but we gave birth to win. We have not brought salvation to the earth. Boy, that is fascinating stuff there, that Israel could not bring about their own salvation. God would have to ultimately bring about Jesus Christ. That's the anticipation of this. And your dead, verse 19, will live, Yahweh. Their bodies will rise. Speaking of resurrection, Verse 21, see the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The great day of the Lord language there. The earth will disclose the blood shed on it and the earth will conceal its slain no more. 27.1, in that day, that great day that you do all of these things, the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great and powerful sword, the one that Jesus has in Revelation 19. And Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, he will slay that great monster of the sea in that day. You see this this creature, this this dragon-like creature will be destroyed finally by God in the end. That was the Old Testament anticipation. When you hear and read in Job, okay, about Leviathan and behemoth, don't start thinking about crocodiles and elephants. That's not what's going on in that text whatsoever. These were the great mythological creatures in the mindset of these people that were the most terrifying things they could imagine. They were dragon-like. They were hideous. They were the great fear that these people had. And yet, ultimately, as Old Testament teaches, Yahweh will subdue and destroy them. In the picture of Job, it's so great, right? Leviathan swimming around like he's a little rubber ducky in God's bathtub. That's kind of the picture that he paints of this creature. Why? Because God will destroy him. God will undo him. But that's the background of what's going on in Revelation 12 with this this dragon-like creature. It's this great adversary of God that one day in his judgment as God brings about resurrection, as God brings about his plan of salvation, as God steps into time once again, he will end this guy. And yet this guy is attempting to thwart 
God's plan in Revelation 12 by consuming and devouring God's child. If he can stamp out God's Messiah, he thinks he can end God's plan. That's the picture that's going on here. Did that happen when Jesus was born? Was there somebody on earth that was trying to stamp out God's plan when Jesus was born? Yes, if you read Matthew 1 and 2, right? This was what Herod was doing. Herod wanted to kill that Messiah. He wanted to end the life of that child when he heard about this one who was threatening his own rule, his own kingdom. And that's exactly how the adversary works. He works through the powers of this world to accomplish his plan, to use their arrogance, their power, their position to try to thwart God's plan. And in that text, the great destroyer killed and slaughtered children in that text. Boy, if that's not appropriate to what's going on in our context today, right? When we hear of 19 children being brutally murdered by, let's just be honest, real darkness. I mean, that's what that is. And our society will never want to actually go here with it, but there are very powerful and dark beings that want to do exactly that, want to stamp out the image of God in people by chaos and destruction in this world. That power stood behind Herod when it tried to stamp out God's Messiah because Satan destructively attempts to thwart God's plans. But verse 5 in, intercedes here the Notice this, she gave birth to a son, so here comes the Messiah, a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter, Psalm 2.9, speaking of that promise of Messiah, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. God, and here's the third truth I want us to see, God eternally established Christ's kingdom through his life, through his crucifixion, through his resurrection and his ascension. You see, despite the dragon's best efforts, God's chosen king still came. The one who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. The child was snatched up to God. The child was snatched up to God's throne, the place where God rules. And we see here once again, God's plans for his son and God's plans for his people cannot be undone. When God has declared this will happen, it will happen. No matter how much Satan tries to thwart God's plans, he cannot undo them. The irony here, though, is that the establishment of Christ's throne, the establishment of what his kingdom will be, is that he ascended to that throne, not by avoiding death, but by what? Going through death. The great dragon thought he did consume Jesus when he put him to death on the cross. He thought he did thwart God's plan when Messiah was put to death. And yet, this is the beauty of the work of Christ. Christ's ascension, his exaltation, he even predicted it. it I will, this will come when I am lifted up like the serpent was in the wilderness. Because God's victory comes through the sacrifice and the death of Jesus. And at the moment, Satan thought he was winning. At the moment, it seems like the beast has stamped out the witness of God's plans on earth. What happens? God brings life, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it defeats the plans of Satan. That's the vision that John has here. And this, this one then that has died and is now risen ascends to heaven, ascends to the throne, the place of God's rule. It will seem at times that those who oppose God are winning. But that's because we can anticipate the same treatment that Jesus Christ experienced, the same things that he experienced. The witness mirrors Christ. And we are called, in our witness, to mirror the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because his resurrection life is in us. Notice the fourth truth out of this scene, though, as it closes in verse 6. The woman fled to the wilderness, to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. God caringly protects his people as they wait for Christ's kingdom to come. There's an irony here for us, right? Christ goes to heaven. 
He's safe in heaven. But we are left here on earth, right? The woman is left. The people of God are left. The woman is not taken to heaven. And she must await his coming. And while she awaits that coming, she must find her solace and her protection in the wilderness, in the desert. And again, this is, this is picking up themes that are found throughout Scripture. When God delivered Israel, brought that great plan of salvation in the Old Testament to its fruition as that great day of salvation came at the Exodus where the Red Sea was parted and his people walked across on dry land and that Pharaoh's serpent dragon was crushed by those waves in that initial defeat of him. Where does God's people go? They're taken into the wilderness, into the desert where they will experience what? Testing. And Israel will fail that test. And even though they fail that test and fail to enter the promised land, God still preserves them, God still protects them, and ultimately raises up a people that do go into his promised land. Jesus will come one day, and Jesus will undo everything Israel did wrong. And Jesus will come, and Jesus will be led by the very Holy Spirit, where? Into the desert, same Greek word that pops up here in Revelation 12, into that wilderness place, where he will be tested and tempted and tried just like Israel, except he doesn't fail like Israel did. Christ fulfills all of that and defeats the great adversary deceiver there and ultimately brings about God's plan of salvation. He's protected, he's nourished. We get the same picture here that this woman, although Christ goes to heaven, this woman now finds herself in this place of desert, this place of wilderness where she will have to rely on God's care and provision for her. And again, we see this reference to this 1260 days, which will come up later as a time, times, and half a time. It's referencing back to Daniel that time, that this eschatological day. That's scene one. And yet, when she's taken to the desert, the text immediately jumps to heaven. Then war broke out, and war broke out in heaven at this. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. The second scene is a war scene in heaven between this dragon and the forces of Christ. Satan, in this vision, has been defeated and cast out of heaven by the enthronement and the rule of Messiah. And the great question out of these verses is, well, when does this take place? When does this happen? And there is debate about this among scholars. Some see that this is referencing actually the very ancient story of Satan in the, even before the garden, rebelling against God and being cast out. Others see it as future, way out in the future, not, maybe not way out for us anymore, but out in the future, that during the time of tribulation, there will be a war breaks out in heaven and Satan will be hurled to the earth, and then during that time of tribulation, this will go on. But in Revelation 12, the timing events, as we're watching this story unfold, place this earlier. They place it in the time of Christ. The, the chronology is the birth of Messiah, his ascension to the Father's side, the woman having to escape, and war breaking out. That's really how this story just unfolds in quick sequence like that. And so my understanding of this text is that this takes place when Christ was ascended to the right hand of the Father. Ascension is a big deal in Scripture that our churches really don't pay much attention to anymore. But ascension is Christ's establishment, his exaltation in heaven, his authority established over the powers of this world. And I would, I would put to you that that's what's going on here. When Christ, after his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, takes his place at the right hand of the Father, Satan is cast out of heaven. Okay, And so a few things happen here at this war in Christ's enthronement. Number one, Christ's enthronement, his taking that place at his ascension, removed Satan's role as the accuser of God's people. Satan was right to see Jesus as his great rival, the one that needed to be stopped, but he was incapable of doing that. Even when he thought he had stamped Christ out, Christ rose from the dead, and when Christ ascended, that means that once he enters heaven, Satan has no more place in heaven. He cannot go there anymore. 
What's Satan's great role in the Old Testament? In fact, the word Satan means this. Accuser. Adversary. The one who stands opposed to and he makes accusation against the people of God. This is the story of him in Job 1 and 2 where he's bringing accusation against Job. This is the story of him in Zechariah 3 where he's bringing accusation against God's anointed one. Satan did that. He brought accusation. He would bring up our failure, our weakness, our inability before God. But once Christ is there, Christ is our atoning sacrifice. He covers all of what we can't cover. He gives us access to the Father. And so there's no more accusation that can be brought against the people of God because Christ is there. So when if you could bring accusation, Jesus is just going to go, uh, I'm here. You can't bring accusation against those who are mine, right? Because my blood covers them. That's what it means to be fully sanctified in Jesus Christ. You are perfectly holy in God's eyes, and nothing can separate you from that position because you are in Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus Christ is ascended to the right hand of the Father, this aspect of Satan is done. He can't bring an accusation against you because you are in Jesus Christ. He's expelled from that and hurled down to the earth. Notice the song that is sung at this great war. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Messiah, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down to the earth. This this is so fascinating if you understand your Old Testaments because this this whole scene picks up the scene that's in Daniel 7. Daniel 7, if you can remember back, and we're not going to turn there, but I'll try to pull out bits and pieces of it. Remember, Daniel has this vision of these creatures, these animals that represent kingdoms that would come and stand opposed to God's plan. And he had a, a vision of a, a lion-like creature, and he had a vision of a bear, and he had a vision of a leopard that had four heads, and then he had this vision of this great and terrible beast with its ten horns. If you add up the heads on those four beasts, how many do you get? Seven. If you add up the horns that are there, how many do you get? Ten. Notice how the dragon was described here in verses three and four. It's a seven-headed monster with ten horns. He's grabbing that vision and saying, this is the power that stands behind all of these social and, and economic and political powers of this world. This is the being that's there that is opposing God through these other things. And, and that, that the beast was, we'll see, as he empowers this one beast that will rise up and brag and do all of this stuff in that vision. That one comes before the Ancient of Days and the Ancient of Days is seen in his heavenly council. And who ultimately is the one who brings the end to that beast? It's this one who comes riding in on the what? The clouds. The cloud rider in in Daniel chapter 7 comes into the very throne room of God and establishes a kingdom that lasts forever and ever. And if you read the rest of Daniel 7 in the interpretation of that text, he speaks about how this beast will oppose the holy ones, the saints, the kedeshim, the, the holy ones of God. And yet the establishment of this throne and this ruler will bring about the defeat of this one as he establishes his kingdom. John's picking up all of that stuff This time, times, and half a time, that that language is brought up in Daniel 7. John's saying, this is what we're talking about here. That big, horrible creature will be brought and cast out by the rule of Jesus Christ. And we're seeing it portrayed in Revelation 12. Notice verse 11 in this song. They triumphed over him. Who triumphed over him? The followers, the brothers and the sisters triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is the second truth that this war in heaven at Christ's enthronement teaches us, that Christ's enthronement enables his followers to defeat Satan. You and I get to defeat Satan. Now, you and I don't have the power to do this. We don't bring it about through our own victory. But this victory comes according to this text. Why? How? By the blood of the lamb. Jesus' sacrifice brings about this defeat in the lives of those who hold to and cling to that sacrifice as they're standing before God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if his sacrifice is what you trust in and believe in and have aligned your life with as the thing that gives you standing with the Father, you are victorious over Satan. That's how you will defeat him. They are victorious by the blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
The powers of this world don't have the final say over us. Christ's kingdom is what rules over us and in us and through us. And it's that that will defeat Satan. But there's another means in this text, not only by the power of the Lamb, but by the word of their testimony. Through their witness, that word for testimony is the same word witness, occurs again and again in Revelation. Jesus is the faithful witness. We are called to be witnesses. Chapter 11 had these two witnesses that speak of what his people do how he announces his salvation to this world. And we further demonstrate our victory through our witness by speaking the truth to a world that is under the power of the great deceiver. And we see it all the time. If you can't see the deceiver deceiving this world in our country today, then you're blind spiritually, okay? It's happening all around us as he deceives and and convinces people that if they live according to their own desires, their own flesh, the powers of this world, that they will find satisfaction, that they will find meaning, that they will find fulfillment, that this will make them happy, and they are being deceived by this deceiver while they're receiving and submitting to that. It is our responsibility to announce where real victory is, and that is through the blood of the Lamb. This is what delivers you. This is what saves you. This is what will ultimately give you satisfaction in life. And that message is to come through the witness of the gospel, not by our our carefully crafted arguments to undo the LGBTQ arguments of our day. What needs to be stated and seen in the believer is the gospel of Jesus Christ lived out in love to the people of this world, right? That's the message. That's how we win and defeat Satan and undo his deception. And it's why, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to be committed to that gospel and submitting our lives to that gospel so that our message and our witness isn't undone by our actions and our lives. And we saw that again this last week as a massive denomination within our nation came under what? Huge scrutiny about the sexual misconduct of its leadership. And what does that do? It sullies and destroys the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's why if we are Christians, we cannot align ourselves with the things of this world and, the, and the, the pursuits of this world and the sin of this world, even though we think we're getting away with it because Satan will use it to destroy our testimony. It is through our witness in our lives that we demonstrate Christ's victory over Satan on earth today. It's why we say no to sin. There's one more means that is pointed to in this passage. Notice at the end of verse 11, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. The third means that we conquer Satan is through giving up of our lives for Jesus Christ. We conquer our foe by giving our lives for Jesus Christ. Does that mean I gotta gotta go out there and be murdered for the gospel of Jesus Christ, put to death, I don't think the text is saying all of that. Now, that will be the lot for some that God allows that to happen to in this life. There are missionaries who've gone to foreign fields to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ who have lost their lives in that process. There are believers today who are living in countries where they are holding to the gospel of Jesus Christ and it could result in them being put to death for the call of Christ upon their life. That still goes on. But at its very least for us today, this text indicates that we must surrender our own wills, our interests, our choices to the will of Jesus Christ that is represented in his word. We are to give up our lives and lay down our lives for Jesus Christ. That means what Christ said in his gospels, that who wants to be, whoever wants to be a follower of me, whoever wants to follow me, must deny themselves, give up their wills and their choices, and take up their cross and follow me, obey me. That's the gospel call upon our life if we're a follower of Jesus Christ. Because we are not our own anymore. We've been bought with a price. We were crucified with Jesus Christ. So we don't live. Christ lives in us. So my will, my choices must be laid down, must be given up. My life must be laid down for Jesus Christ. That's the challenge, I think, of this text for the North American Christian today. As we testify to the truth of Jesus Christ, we recognize that we will be opposed 
And this opposition will forcefully come against us. Yet, as it comes against us, if we are clinging to the sacrifice of the Lamb, if we are testifying about the hope that is in us, and if we are willing to give up our lives so that Jesus Christ can magnify himself through us, we can rest assured that Satan is defeated and we are victorious. That's the second scene. Actually, there's one more part to this. Notice how the song ends in verse 12. Now have come the salvation, the power, the glory, all this stuff. They triumphed over him by land. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, and he's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Christ's enthronement. The third part to this scene is this, that Christ's enthronement has made the defeated enemy apoplectic and desperate. I, I love that word, apoplectic. I wanted to use it today. Apoplectic, what does it mean? It just means completely enraged and furious. That's who the enemy is now, and he is desperate. Throughout the middle and end of this entire depiction, and we'll see it in the verses that follow as well, Satan, this great enemy, becomes enraged, not because he is so powerful, but because he is so desperate. He knows he is losing, and his time is short. This is the defeated foe who is desperate. Let me just use a sports analogy for a moment. You, know, you get to the end of the basketball game and you're down by six with 30 seconds left. What are you doing? You start doing desperate things. You start fouling the other team, putting them on the free throw line, allowing them to shoot for free points. Why? So you can hope they miss and you can get the ball back. Like you, you start doing things that don't make sense. You have to do desperate stuff. The Lightning are in the playoffs right now, right? This is the great Tampa hope for hockey right now. And, and if you're in a, a hockey game and it's, it's two to one and you're losing and there's a minute and a half left, what do you do? You pull your goalie. You empty your own net. You allow them to have free shots without a goalie there. Why? Because you're so desperate you have to score to make this thing even. That's Satan. He is desperate to try to win at this point. He can't win. He knows he can't win, but he is a desperate and enraged enemy that is seeking to thwart God's plans still. That's the picture here. Just because he has lost his ability to bring accusation against God's people before God, this does not mean that we will be exempt then from the rage of the enemy. No, this is the point. Woe to you, earth. He's coming down to you now. That's an ironic song they sing in heaven, right? Heaven's rejoicing because he's kicked out, but thanks, heaven, for sending him down here, right, so he can torture us. I mean, that's kind of the picture of this song, but that's the reality of this. That he stands opposed and we can anticipate his rage poured out because he cannot bring accusation against us any longer. That takes us to the last scene, and we'll look at this one quickly. The war that takes place on earth, not in heaven any longer, as Satan seeks to destroy God's plans for his people. When the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle. I can't remember what verse that is in the Old Testament, but it does come out of one of these verses in the Old Testament. It is Exodus, Exodus 19.4. This is the same kind of language that's used of Israel as they are delivered from Egypt. They fly on eagle's wings out to the desert so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. There is, there's our reference to Daniel. Out of the serpent's reach, Daniel 7. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth, swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. You see this war break out on earth as Satan tries to destroy God's plans for his people. And it shows us, first of all, that although he desperately tries, Satan attempts to thwart God's plan. Satan's attempts to thwart God's plans for his people, they prove futile. This is an exercise in futility. He cannot accomplish this. The woman is pursued here by the dragon who is unable to ultimately do anything to her because she is being providentially protected and provided for. This is the Exodus motif in the wilderness. And it is in the wilderness that she is protected. The wilderness is a place that requires of its people what? Perseverance and obedience. You are going to have to persevere because God hasn't taken us out of this world. He leaves us in this world and you persevere through your submission and obedience to Jesus Christ. The reality for God's people today as church is that we may have to separate at times. We might have to ourselves go to what the society would think of as the wilderness 
rejecting what society deems as important, rejecting what society says will bring satisfaction because those things are incompatible with following Jesus Christ. Christian, that's going to be our lot, right? We're not going to fit into this world because this world isn't our home. We're those who aren't of this world. And while God has left us in this world, we are to be distinct from this world. We are the salt. We are the light that stands out as distinct from the context around it. Whether that means social or economic or even religious distinction, we are to be distinct because we follow Jesus Christ. We are to flee the lures and the deceptions of this world if we are to ultimately be effective witnesses. That's the tension of living in this world but not being of this world. And then there's one other truth that this shows us, and as yet Satan will continually wage war on the followers of Christ. Notice the end. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and who hold fast their testimony about Jesus. If we keep God's commands and we hold fast to the witness of Jesus Christ, we are told here that we can anticipate the adversary is coming for us and he is enraged and he wants to destroy us. And 1 Peter 5 uses the example of the lion who roams us earth looking to those he can devour. He wants to destroy our lives, our testimony, our witness. While he might not ultimately defeat Jesus' church, he will wage war against us individual Christians, us bodies of believers here. So who are we? Well, we are armed with the knowledge that this adversary is a defeated and desperate enemy, and we as believers can be strengthened to continue to endure because we know that God wins in the end. And we know he's protecting us. Whatever Satan tries to throw tries to wash out with a flood. God opens the earth and protects. God provides. God delivers his people and he will continue to to deliver those who are faithful to him. It doesn't mean we escape death. Hey, that's a lot for all of us. We're all going to die. Right? Unless Christ returns, you're going to die. I I mean, no matter how much we want to escape it, that's the lot in life for us. Might as well lose our life for Christ, right? That's the picture that's painted here. What's the point of this text as we close this morning? We participate in Christ's victory over Satan through our faithful witness as we lay down our lives to follow him. This is what defeats the enemy. This is the great victory song of heaven that those who participate in Christ's victory over Satan do so through their faithful witness as they follow Jesus Christ laying down their lives. As we close, be reminded of this, Christian, despite how much it might look like it and not look like it in the present church in America, despite how much it might not look like this in the present church in America, the Christian life does not lead to ease and prosperity. That's not church history. That's not the first century church. We're the anomaly. And I think the reason that we so bristle against persecution, bristle against what this story is all about is because we've had it so easy. But that's not the picture of Christ's bride ultimately. The true picture, the spiritual picture is marked by spiritual opposition from a very scary and powerful foe that has been defeated by Jesus Christ but has become so desperate in his pursuit to destroy God's plan and his people that he will go to any lengths to attack us. That's the spiritual reality that we are experiencing. So our success in this life cannot be measured in the wealth that we amass or the prosperity that we get to live in or the fame that we are able to garner from others. But our success in life is seen in our devotion to the good news of Jesus Christ as it's displayed in our obedience to his word and in our faithful witness that his kingdom is the ultimate victory. But as I look around, and this is the thought that struck me this morning as I was thinking on the final application of this text, 
I wonder how many of us have fallen under the deception of our adversary, thinking that it's all about attainment in this world. I know we don't confess that with our mouth, but if you would look at our checkbooks, if you would look at our choices, if you look at what we give our time to, does that look like that's the testimony of Jesus Christ and laying down our choices and our wills to follow him? Or does that look like we're pursuing the prosperity of this world, Christian? Because I think for a lot of us, it looks like that. And this text is a wake-up call to say, you're, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you, that's not you, that's not your testimony, that's not where your hope lies. And in fact, if we just continue to go down that road, we will lose all effective witness within this world. Christ manifests himself and is seen in us when we give up our choices to follow him. We have the truth. We're on the winning side. But to those around us that see us and interact with us, do they know that truth through our testimony? Or would they see in us the same life that they're trying to live, the same prosperity they're trying to seek, and see the same deception that they are blind to ruling our lives? You see, the testimony of Jesus Christ isn't just because we know this. It's seen in the lives that we live and the things that we say with our mouth as we testify to the hope of that kingdom. Is that true of you? We're not going to have a final song this morning, but I'm going to lead us in a prayer, praying this for us today. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes as we close in prayer. Lord, as we come today, I pray that you would use this text. Please, Lord, let your Holy Spirit not let anyone leave this morning without the realization of this spiritual struggle that's going on in this world. You're on one of two paths. That's, that's the story of this. You're either with the dragon or you are with Jesus Christ. And as we will see, the dragon will empower beasts that will arise in these next chapters that will lead many astray to follow the systems of this world, the economic success of this world but you show, Lord, the deception, the complete destruction of where that ends if we give our lives to that. So, Lord, may you, through your Holy Spirit, convict even this morning any here who have not trusted in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who have not chosen to align themselves with your Lamb. May they see today that no works they can do can bring this victory. Nothing that they can do can defeat this enemy. No ritual or thing that happened to them as a child brings about your salvation. Your salvation comes through the, the work of your Son, through his own sacrifice, his resurrection, and ultimately his ascension. That's where your kingdom is powerful in establishing its rule on earth today. It's in the lives of those who give up their life and allow Jesus Christ to rule and reign in them. Lord, may no one leave this morning not knowing and being convicted of that reality. And at the same time, Lord, please awaken in your church this morning The reality of the deception that is all around us. We swim in it. I think that's why we don't notice it, Lord. It's the air we breathe. And yet this is being empowered by a foe that wants to destroy us. Destroy our testimony. And he is enraged. So Lord, may you point out those areas in the lives of us as believers that claim the name of Jesus Christ. Show us, Lord, where we are not submitting our wills to the rule of Jesus Christ. Show us where we are not laying down our lives, but our time is being occupied by the things of this world. Show us where we are being deceived by this enemy that still wants to destroy us and destroy our witness and our testimony. And Lord, may we be those who are willing to embrace the isolation of the wilderness 
the perseverance that is required there, but Lord, also the care and the protection that you give us as we are pilgrims in this world and strangers in this world. And may you, Lord, shine brightly through your salt and your light to show that there's a hope and it's in Jesus Christ and that's the answer. That's where satisfaction is found. That's where eternal provision will be made. Or testify and witness to that truth through Clearwater Community Church in this community until you return. May that be the witness that comes out. May you defeat your enemy here through our church over these next days and months and years. And may you find when you return a group of faithful witnesses that cling to the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Do that in your people this week here as we go and testify to the hope that is in us through our lives, through the lives that we live in obedience to you and through the words that we say in witness for Jesus Christ. All of this, Lord, to bring you glory, to usher in your son's kingdom as we await that day of his return. Empower your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go in the grace, the glory of Jesus Christ, witnessing to that reality, and we'll gather next week to look at the other terrible beast that comes up in Revelation 13. But have a great week. Enjoy Memorial Day. We'll see you next week.